Welcome everyone to Equity by Design, the inaugural session, the first of nine. We are at full capacity, as you can tell. We actually had to cut off registration, so yay for all of you for getting here, finding a seat, dealing with the lines, dealing with the parking, the traffic, whatever it took to get here. We're excited. Um, I'm uh, Janet Carlson. I'm one of the co-leaders of this initiative that is behind the um, seminar series that you're participating, and I want to introduce the rest of the team that made this happen. Bridget Barron, wave your hand. You'll hear a lot more from Bridget later tonight. Amber, why don't you stand? Amber Levison is our research associate doing fantastic work um, talking to our speakers, recruiting people, getting a theme going for the seminar. Angela Estrella is an instructional coach and professional development associate in the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching, and she's the reason there are over 20 teachers registered for this seminar and taking it for CEUs who really care about the intersection of equity, technology, and learning. Teachers, you want to raise your hand? Yay, there you are. Great. There's no school of education without teachers, right? Um, the other thing I want to point out tonight are all the people, parties, groups involved in this kind of work. This is an exciting collaborative adventure that we're embarking on, and the point is to have multiple perspectives. Some you may agree with, some you may never have heard of. Others may excite you to change whatever it is that makes you drive to work each day. And over the course of the next nine weeks, we hope to, um, I'll steal one of Angela's words, ignite that thought about what could happen and what the promise of the future is. So I want to do one more thing and explain a little bit about the name of the initiative that we're working under, which is telos, a Greek word that comes to us meaning end, purpose, ultimate object, or aim. In other words, working with intention toward the thing that matters. And when we were working on how we were going to name the work that came under the umbrella of this initiative, that's the word we landed on as really capturing what we're trying to have people embark on in understanding technology for equity in learning opportunities. So the last thing I want to say, if I haven't, I want to illustrate the point about the diversity of the audience. We've got teachers here taking this for continuing education credits as well as those just attending for their own edification. We've got Stanford students taking this seminar series for a course as credit. And the vast majority of you are from Stanford and the world beyond, and you're here because you're personally interested. We actually had to cut off registration, um, and that's a great thing to know this many people are interested. So without further ado, I will turn the mic over to our Dean, Dan Schwartz, to welcome you all, and then we'll move on to the seminar. Thank you, Janet. Uh, so I'm, I'm supposed to take a minute, exactly one. So uh, I want to welcome you all to the kickoff event of the Telos Initiative. This is a very exciting initiative. Uh, technology is, it can be great for disrupting the status quo, or it can be very efficient at increasing the status quo. So this is a great topic for uh, thinking about equity. This, this initiative was largely uh, the result of a, a far-sighted gift from Angela Nomalini and Ken Olivier. They've been uh, longtime friends of Stanford and the GSE. And so this is, this is sort of their child that Bridget and Janet have fashioned into this great program of which the speaker series is one part. So I'd, I'd like just for a moment to thank our donors and our organizers. <laughs> and, and now I hand it off to one of the masterminds behind it all, uh, Professor Barron. So I don't think I need this.
Okay. Welcome again. Uh, we're really <laughs> excited to have you all here and to help catalyze a conversation that's actually going on nationally, but we, we really want to have this conversation also locally and regionally. Um, I want to say a, a little bit, give you a little bit of history. So this seminar series, Education's Digital Future, was launched in 2012. Roy P., who's right here, was one of the co-founders along with Mitch Stevens, and they wanted to start a conversation about the future of education <coughs> given the rapid pace of innovation in technology. And they were focused mostly on higher education. But they also had a session, a great session, on equity and learning. And so we are going to build on that one week that they had throughout the whole quarter. We have two wonderful speakers this evening who are going to help us um, launch this conversation. They're both groundbreaking thinkers in this area. Before I make formal introductions, I want to just make a few remarks. Um, our two featured speakers, Craig Watkins and Chris Gutierrez, will be spending uh, 20 minutes each giving us their view of the intersection of these issues. And then our co-host, Mohammed Chaudhary, will be uh, also giving his regional perspective. So the, the larger national conversation about technology, equity, and learning opportunities is reflected in lots of different recent reports from government and from foundations. So the, um, the most recent uh, national educational technology plan that came out in 2016 focuses centrally on this question of how do we make sure that digital technologies will increase equity and learning opportunities as well as accessibility to all learners. Um, other reports that have come out of MacArthur Foundation, that have come out of um, Aspen Foundation, out of the NRC, the National Research Council, also reflect a real concern as well as enthusiasm for the intersection of thinking about learning and technology, especially as it relates to learning across setting and across time. All of these reports are starting to cite national quantitative data that um, in some ways tells an old story about digital divide issues in terms of access being linked to issues of socioeconomic status, gender, where you live in the country, but that also tell a really important story about how more and more Americans are using the internet to learn, to work, to gain health information, apply for jobs, and, and starting to really talk about the importance of everyone understanding how to use technology in powerful ways for their own prosperity, their own health, as well as their ability to contribute to their communities. We also know that children are enthusiastic users of technology. So we have lots and lots of uh, portraits, survey data that show um, increasing amounts of time spent with different kinds of digital media. You know, with the advent of the tablet, for example, we, uh, in 2010, from then to 2013, we saw a tripling in mobile use um, for children. However, we also know that the form and degree of use varies a lot among children. There's a lot of content out, of, out there. Not all of it is great content. And so we really need to understand more about what children are accessing and whether and how it relates to learning. Um, we also know that there's a lot of variability, right? So this is actually coming from the, the census, and it's, I think it's pretty recent, uh, 2013. There's actually a new report that shows a similar uh, kind of picture. And what this data is showing is actually uh, internet access broadband um, at home, and it's showing variability across the country. These are just metropolitan areas. And so we, anywhere that you see the dark green, there's higher than average internet access and use. So if you look at where we are in Silicon Valley, that's true. If you look at the areas that are purple, light purple and dark purple, those, um, those areas have lower internet access and use. And so what you see across the country is despite overall trends that everyone's getting access, there's still a lot of regional variability that we need to be thinking about. But we also know, right, from lots and lots of research that it's not about the technology, it's really about how we organize learning experiences. And so um, one of the things that a lot of us have been thinking about is how do we think about the quality of learning experiences in relation to technology that empower young people and adults to have agency, to be civically engaged, um, and to engage in inquiry learning and really deeper learning. At the same time, and this is why it's an exciting conversation, 
we have a lot of concerns out there, and we're going to hear more about this from our speakers. But there are concerns about technology being pushed on schools and on children and on families. And there's concerns about transparency of information, right? We have so many layers of digital information now that it's really actually difficult sometimes to tell whether something's accurate or not, who's creating that content. There's a lack of transparency. And so people really are talking a lot about the need for everyone to be critically engaged in information and to be able to really discern what is credible source or not. There's also, as I said, a lot of variability in the quality of content, right? So if you look at digital content, there's wonderful uh, resources out there, and many of them are free, but it's very hard to find them. And then there's also concerns about the disruption of our very precious resource of human social interaction because of devices. And we are all prone to this being drawn to our devices and not necessarily focusing on who's in the room, who we're talking to. Um, at the same time, media can draw people together and, and really create interesting conversations. So all this to say is that we're in a very complicated and interesting space, and that's why we're excited to be talking with all of you all quarter. So at this intersection of technology, equity, and learning, there are many different kinds of questions. Three that we really are going to focus on, um, how do we think about variation in access to devices and broadband, and how does that correlate with pathways to learning opportunities? Second, what experiences with digital tools and content support deeper learning and creative agency, and how do we make sure that all learners have these kinds of experiences? Third, how can we better support teachers, parents, and community organizations to broker and design powerful learning with digital resources? So these are big, hefty questions. Um, they aren't going to be answered this quarter, for sure. Uh, the point really is to more to have conversation and to begin to ca ca capitalize on our collective creativity to think about them. Um, one thing that a lot of us in the Life Center, this is a Science of Learning Center, which has been uh, in operation for 10 years, and we've just finished. We've graduated. Um, <laughs> yay. One of the things that um, we really worked a lot on is trying to think about how do we conceptualize learning across setting and across time. So one of the representations that we have as a focal representation represents the time we spend in formal settings, and that's represented in orange, and the time that we spend out of formal educational settings, which is represented by the blue. We call it the sea of blue. And one of the things that this really draws attention to is that there's a lot of opportunity to learn outside of school as well as inside of school. And so how do we think about synergies between in-school and out-of-school learning? Um, we know that at home there's a lot of learning going on. We're going to hear a lot about this, I think, tonight. Um, public institutions like libraries and museums provide opportunities for learning, community centers, and then, of course, at school. So I'm going to now introduce our speakers because um, we are very, very fortunate to have two of the members of the Connected Learning Network. This was an effort uh, that was funded by the MacArthur Foundation. They've been working on this uh, conceptualization of digital learning for the past 10 years, I, I think that's right, about 10 years. And, um, and they both have really enormous insights around this, um, these questions that we're going to be uh, talking about. So first, I'm going to introduce Craig Watkins. Professor Watkins studies young people's social and digital media participation. He teaches at the University of Texas at Austin in the departments of radio, television, film, sociology, and the Center for African American and Afri African Studies. Craig is also a faculty fellow for the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement at the University of Texas at Austin. He's the author of three books on youth culture, including The Young and the Digital, What the Migration to Social Network Sites Gains in Anytime, Anywhere Media Means for Our Future. And he has a forthcoming book that examines current debates around the digital divide, education, and technology. So we're really thrilled to have a preview of some of the thoughts that will be in that book tonight. Our second speaker, Chris Gutierrez, is Professor of Language, Literacy, and Culture at the Graduate School of Education, University of California, Berkeley. Her research examines learning with a special focus on students from non-dominant communities and English language learners. Her work in social design experiments seeks to leverage students' everyday concepts and practices to ratchet up expansive forms of learning. Um, 
Professor Gutierrez has received numerous awards for her work, and I cannot list them all, but one of them includes the 2014 Distinguished Contributions to Social Context and Education Research, uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, and the 2014 Henry Trueba Award for Research Leading to the Transformation of Social Context of Education. She also, in 2005, won the uh, Division C Sylvia Scribner Award, which I will say our dean is about to uh, receive the same award, AERA, <laughs> to both of them. <laughs> Professor Gutierrez's leadership includes membership in the National Academy of Education. She's a past president of the American Educational Research Association. She was appointed by President Obama and confirmed by the U.S. Senate as a member of the National Board for the Institute of Education Sciences, where she served as vice chair. And I think it's safe to say that Chris's um, entire program of research has focused on the topic that we're going to be discussing in 10 weeks, which is equity by design. And uh, she has done really amazing work thinking about how to build resilient ecologies across school and out of school. And so we're really fortunate to hear from her this evening. We're going to start with Craig tonight, and then we'll move to Chris's presentation, and then Mohammed is going to um, take it from there and try to uh, connect the dots in terms of regional innovation here in Sil Silicon Valley. And we're going to do one bit of housekeeping while Craig comes up and gets his presentation. Let's figure out the chair situation. Okay. Oh, maybe it wasn't open yet. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, all right, great, thanks. Um, thank you, Bridget, for the uh, introduction, and Amber and the team here. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to be here, and um, thank you all on the Monday after spring break. So it's, it's a pretty amazing um, uh, turnout uh, for, uh, for this e sort of inaugural event. Um, so we have about 20 minutes, so I'll try to, uh, I'll move through these pretty briskly. Um, I think the, uh, the thing that we're most excited about is the conversation that will ensue afterwards. So I'll um, uh, basically just kind of talk through some of the research that I've been doing over the last five or six years or so, particularly related to the Connected Learning uh, Research Network project that uh, Chris and I have been a part of, a larger initiative that the MacArthur Foundation launched uh, about a little over 10 years ago or so. Um, and, the, and the mission, simply put, was to explore how learning lives of young people are changing as a result of the sort of digital age and digital world. And as you can imagine, a very simple question, uh, but uh, the, the various kinds of responses, answers, uh, approaches, analyses have been quite expansive over that time. Uh, and so what, we'll, what I'll try to offer today is just a, a bit of the work that we've been doing, uh, primarily in the Austin metropolitan area, uh, which in some ways has been um, a really interesting laboratory to sort of think about issues of equity, uh, technology, education, uh, and building more equitable uh, learning futures. So really kind of as a result of this work, I've, I've had an opportunity to um, just to, to visit and observe and, and do research in a variety of different learning settings, uh, both formal learning settings. So here is a, a group of first graders uh, in the Bronx. Uh, and in this particular classroom, about 95% of the students were coming from homes uh, where English was not the, uh, the, the language spoken. Uh, so sort of speaking to the issues of diversity uh, and how the, the evolution of diversity in this country has really sort of come to uh, the fore in some pretty significant and historic kinds of ways. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, the ways in which games are entering into our learning environment. Uh, this is um, a school from New York City uh, that was incorporating um, sort of game, game and design thinking into the classroom, but just sort of looking at the ways in which uh, new kinds of curriculum were being developed uh, as a way to fashion new kinds of learning settings and new kinds of learning spaces. Um, here was an opportunity that I had in Buenos Aires, um, Argentina, uh, to visit 
um, a series of schools where they were adopting uh, notebooks and really trying to bring um, technology uh, into um, lower income schools, uh, high poverty schools, uh, and a lot of the issues and challenges that are faced there. Of course, as Bridget was saying, learning happens uh, in, in, in a variety of places now. Uh, here is um, the museum um, in uh, San Francisco uh, where, um, you know, young people get to tinker, get to play with things, get to, get to uh, sort of be hands-on learning. Uh, and here is the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt uh, National Design Museum uh, where they've done a lot of interesting things around design, around civic engagement, uh, and sort of introducing young people to some of the elements of design that are oriented towards um, sort of thinking about uh, their uh, world in sort of unique uh, and interesting uh, kinds of ways. Uh, more recently, um, and I'll only talk a little bit about this, um, my work with the foundation has sort of led me to sort of thinking about um, where young people, how they transition beyond school. Uh, in the kinds of spaces that they inhabit um, after school uh, and where learning takes place in some really interesting um, and provocative kinds of spaces, spaces that we might not necessarily uh, expect. We call this project Doing Innovation, where we look at the ways in which innovation happens sort of in the wild, in the real world. And it can be anywhere from uh, a hip-hop collective that meets every Tuesday night in Austin, Texas, uh, to a co-working space where millennials are sort of creating new kinds of opportunities, new kinds of settings to pursue interest, creativity, entrepreneurship, civic and social innovation in different and unique kinds of spaces. But the kinds of ecologies and ecosystems that they're designing are very much uh, related to the kinds of uh, equitable uh, kinds of spaces and enterprises that I think we're interested in, in terms of our own work. So when I approached this work with the MacArthur Foundation, um, the timing was, was, was interesting in terms of the field work. So we spent uh, about a year and a half in a high school in the Austin metropolitan area. Um, and it was at a time where there was a lot of interesting sort of developments and transitions or transformations happening. And I'll just highlight two or three of them just to give you a sense of the broader kind of historical context, the broader social context, and how in some ways it's this context that really begins to give us greater insights in terms of how we think about learning, whether it's in school or out of school, wherever learning might happen uh, in a young person's life. Uh, so for example, um, here is just um, um, a recent, um, this is based on 2010 census data. Um, the dark blue uh, areas are percentages of infants under age one uh, who are not white. And the dark blue areas are 60% or above, right, in terms of percentage of infants um, uh, in terms of, uh, and what you get a sense of is what um, as some researchers refer to as a kind of diversity explosion, right, where I think for the first time around 2010 or 2011, the majority of kids in the United States were non-white. They were Latino, African-American, Asian, um, multiracial uh, immigrants. And so suggesting, right, that as we think about the future of learning, as we think about design by equity, who are we designing for? What kinds of learning features do we anticipate? Who are our learners likely to be? And increasingly the data suggests that our learners are going to be coming from diverse communities, diverse households, speaking different languages, bringing different kinds of experiences into the classroom and into other kinds of learning settings and how this might sort of influence and impact the way that we think about learning uh, and the future of learning. So here's just another example of how this translates. So this is uh, uh, in Texas, some of the major sort of metropolitan area school districts in Texas. And what you see here, right, is uh, right here at this line uh, is um, uh, the Hispanic student, the percentage of his Hispanic students in school districts across the state of Texas. And in virtually every major metropolitan area and, and not so major metropolitan area across Texas, uh, Hispanic students, Latino students make up at least 50% of the students now represented in those school districts. And that's quite common here in California, uh, other states uh, that sort of move west as well. But we're seeing this um, on the East Coast, we're seeing this in Florida, we're seeing this in other places. So this is something that's becoming not just a regional sort of development, but something that's sort of national in scope. And again, it sort of speaks to, you know, why I think this conversation that you're having is really important because it speaks to local, regional, and sort of national trends uh, that are quite urgent and important and timely. Um, so as we were also embarking on this study, it was also during a time where there was a really sort of, what I would argue is a kind of profound transformation in terms of how we think about who's adopting technology, who's using technology, uh, and sort of moving away from traditional digital divide narratives, right? This idea that certain kids coming from certain households, coming from certain communities, were disconnected, disinterested, in some ways um, um, disenabled from participating in the digital world. And here's just a, a little bit of data from um, the Kaiser Family Foundation. Some of you may be familiar with Vicki Rideout, who's based out here uh, in the Bay Area. Um, but uh, this is a survey that she uh, did with uh, the Kaiser Fa Family Foundation. This is 2010, I think, is, was the reporting here. 
But basically what you see is just the uh, increasing amount of time that kids 8 to 18 year, years old in this survey were spending with media. And what you see is that black and Latino kids spending uh, up to 12 or 13 hours a day exposed to some type of media, some type of screen. And what was interesting about this data, this report, things also coming out of the Pew Internet and American Life Project, things coming out of Nielsen, things coming out of some of the work that we were doing with the MacArthur Foundation, is that for the very first time we were also beginning to see a very different portrait of who was adopting and using computer-mediated technologies, and the Internet more specifically. So for the very first time in this report, and they did it in 2000, I think, 1999, 2005, and in 2010, by 2010, black and Hispanic kids were reporting spending as much time, if not more time, on the Internet than their white and Asian counterparts. And this in some ways begins to usher in a very different kind of era, a very different kind of moment in terms of how we might think about what's happening in the digital world and in the lives of young people. And here's just uh, sort of a look at, um, this is from the Pew Internet and American Life Project, just sort of home broadband demographics. And the, the, the one point that I'll make here is that even as we see uh, wider distribution of the Internet, uh, wider adoption of the Internet, uh, primarily via mobile, and we, and we can certainly talk about the impact of mobile, because uh, I think it's a pretty significant part of the story, and, but a much more complex one than we ordinarily hear in sort of the popular press coverage of mobile and its relationship to the, to the digital divide and access to the Internet. But here what we see, right, is that, is that black and Latino youth are still significantly more likely to live in households that lack access to broadband. Lower income youth are significantly more likely to live in households that lack access to broadband. And this is important, right, because broadband is a gateway to the kinds of rich, meaningful, more robust learning opportunities that, um, that Bridget was referring to. So that we know from the data over the years, right, that kids who grow up in broadband households are more likely not only to spend more time online, but they're more likely to do a broader range of things online, be engaged in a broader range of activities online, and I think more importantly, right, they're also more likely to be producers of information, producers of content, producers of media, as opposed to simply being consumers of content and consumers of media. And this is a very important distinction as we think about literacy, as we think about learning in the digital age, and what it means to have a sense of agency in this sort of new world that we're all sort of embarking upon. So I won't go through this extensively, but as we sort of think about the digital divide, the way in which we've mapped the divide over the last 20 years or so has changed significantly. Uh, so we've moved, I think, further and further away from this primarily being an issue of access to technology. And so now we understand, right, that the issue of the divide has many different components, many different elements, many different layers, right, that render it a very complex and challenging problem still today in 2016 uh, because of a variety of, 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 of issues, right? So not only access to devices, but probably even more importantly, right, access to the human resources, to the skills and dispositions, to the settings and environments that really promote uh, deeper engagement, deeper learning, more expansive forms of participation that are absolutely critical to one's uh, sense of development and evolution in this world. Social resources in terms of the context, the community uh, settings and environments, institutional context that kids have access to. And we know, right, that there's significant variation in terms of the quality of resources that, that young people have access to and how those resources impact opportunities to learn, opportunities to develop the kinds of literacies that really sort of provide the momentum and provide the opportunity uh, to sort of level up uh, in the digital world. So, so over the years, you know, as I've thought about, you know, how we, how we frame this notion of the digital divide and issues of digital equity and disparities, um, this is kind of the, 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 the way in which I'm beginning to frame it in terms of my own work and the work that we're doing in the Austin metropolitan area and even beyond, conversation that we're having uh, with the White House, conversation that we're having with the MacArthur Foundation, conversation that we're having with the Knight Foundation or whomever it might be. But increasingly, right, understanding the, the divide, as I said earlier, and this is something that researchers have known for some time now, right, but, but really beginning to develop, right, a broader kind of d discourse a broader kind of you know, educational environment, a broader set of uh, initiatives that really understand the divide, right, as, as about you know, building access to social and learning resources that support young people's ability, right, to use digital media to design, to, inter to innovate, and I think increasingly, right, to intervene in the world around them. And we're seeing this happening, right, in some very fascinating ways in terms of what young people are doing with, with technology uh, from a civics perspective. So if you think of, of a movement like Black Lives Matter, which is, which is principally, right, uh, a, a movement sort of mediated, right, by the sort of clever adoption of mobile technology, social media, sort of network platforms, and creating new kinds of ways of participating in our civic life, sort of shaping 
both news discourse around race, around policing, around disenfranchisement, that's also even reached now into the, you know, presidential politics. And so in that sense, right, the ways in which um, technology is being leveraged as a way to sort of create new kinds of opportunities and a new sense of agency in the world that young people sort of um, exist in. So, so let me just move really quickly. Uh, I'll just give you sort of a snapshot of some of the work that we've been doing. Um, just one of the studies that we did, we spent about a year and a half in high school, and this was kind of, um, I call it sort of being in the trenches in many respects. Um, myself and, and a group of about six or seven graduate students literally spent, in, you know, an entire school year in a high school. We were fortunate enough uh, because of the foundation, because of the university, and because of the school district that it gave us that kind of access to have this, um, this kind of opportunity to see learning, to see technology, to see issues around equity, to see issues around opportunity up close and personal and in a way uh, that for me was just quite profound, right? Because we can read about this in theory, we can read about this in the abstract, we can speculate about what we think might be happening in our classrooms, we can speculate about what it means when technology begins to enter into the classroom in greater and greater forms, but what its impact is, what its influence is, what the missed opportunity opportunities are is something right that you can only really fully understand when you're kind of immersed in that environment and sort of in that world and so we had a unique opportunity to do that uh, the school that we were in just in terms of just some, some really quick characteristics of the school um, the school district uh, sort of um, identified the school as 55 percent of the students were coming from disadvantaged households 45 percent were at risk and we know right that these labels in some ways work uh, oftentimes uh, to the detriment of students in terms of how they're labeled how they're tracked and what they're presumed to be in terms of their, their capacity to learn, their desire to learn, their interest to learn. And so there are all of those sort of policies that are embedded in the ways in which our students are kind of conditioned, trained, socialized, and tracked to sort of experience school in a very real uh, and significant and profound kind of way. Um, it was primarily a majority of minority school, uh, Latino, African-American students were the, were, the, were the majority, but there were also white and Asian students. And there was, you know, typical of most schools, some tracking in terms of white and Asian students were much more likely to be in advanced placement courses, much more likely to be in college prep courses. And so there, was, there were those kinds of dynamics certainly happening uh, in the school as well. Um, I'll skip through this slide, but we, you know, we did all of the sort of things that we have to do to get approval to be in the school and, 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 and sort of going through our proper protocols and things of that sort. I won't bore you with that. Um, but here's some of the questions that we, uh, that we posed for the, uh, for the project. How is media and technology, how is the media and technology lives of black and Latino uh, youth evolving? What are the challenges that schools face as technology adoption expands? We know that more and more technology, if it's computers, the internet, mobile devices, cloud-based computing, uh, social media, uh, tablets, uh, technology is coming, right? Uh, and there is uh, a recognition that, that, that it, that's important, but there are obviously issues and challenges associated with the greater presence of technology in the classroom. And as Dan said earlier, you know, technology can work to sort of accelerate, right, opportunity and to sort of bridge some of these disparities. But in an interesting and sort of ironic way, technology can also work to sort of accelerate those disparities uh, and reproduce them in ways that are unintended, but nevertheless still detrimental and, and impactful in young people's lives. We also spent a lot of time in the technology classes, and particularly classes that were sort of influenced by this whole discourse around STEM. And so how is just the diffusion of STEM influencing curriculum design and learning? Um, and in some ways, I kind of think that schools are kind of stuck by STEM, right? They're, they're stuck by this, this perception or understanding that they now have to invest heavily in STEM without necessarily understanding what that means and how that should translate into real world learning uh, kinds of experiences. And then finally, we were also curious just about the ways in which black and, and Hispanic youth are sort of remaking uh, longstanding uh, sort of notions about the digital divide and sort of creative and resilient practices uh, that we were able to observe that suggest right, that there's some really interesting sort of distinctions and shifts happening uh, in terms of how we think about and how we have defined uh, digital divides over the course of the years. We spent a lot of time doing this. So we followed uh, students extensively throughout the year, trying to map their media environment, trying to map their media activities across the day, across different settings. Uh, and so just different ways in trying to how, how we visualize, how we understood, how we try to analyze the kinds of media, social, and learning practices that were evident uh, in the school that we were in. Real quickly, um, I can't go over this too extensively, uh, but just in terms of some of the findings from our work, um, just, just three really quick um, sort of headlines, if you will. There's much more, obviously, from a year and a half of field work. 
But you know, we, we were struck by this, this dynamic of we've got tech now what, right, in terms of, so what happens, you know, once a school becomes relatively rich, right, in terms of the technology that they're able to offer their students, even students who are presumed to be disadvantaged, even students who are presumed to be at risk, and whatever those labels tend to connote or suggest about them and their capacity to learn or their desire to learn. Um, you know, we were also sort of uh, struck by this particular uh, question here of who gets to learn STEM uh, and just the ways in which uh, this, this what we call a kind of STEM learning opportunity gap persists in, in, in schools in ways that are quite striking. And then finally here in the middle, uh, we were also just sort of struck by the ways in which students were sort of hacking school, right? The ways in which they were sort of leveraging the after school spaces, leveraging relationships with teachers and their peers to create a kind of informal learning ecology or an informal kind of learning ecosystem that in some ways, right, ran sort of counter to uh, the ways in which they were constrained in the classroom and really sort of enabled them to pursue interest, to pursue uh, creative activities, to pursue more collaborative activities in a way uh, that we think in some ways is, is more similar to a knowledge-based economy than what they were actually doing in the formal learning setting and how they were doing this primarily informally, primarily on their own, and primarily right through the sort of resilient, again, and kind of creative practices that they were participating in. So real quickly, um, so this is, so in 19, this is from um, the National Center for Education and Statistics. So in 1994, about 3% of public schools had instructional rooms with internet um, access, right? It's hard to believe. Uh, not that long ago, actually. And by 2005, you begin to see a significant majority of schools, at least internet enabled. Um, and even though more and more schools, certainly over the course of that time, became more internet enabled, became more connected, um, you know, what that meant in terms of learning opportunities, what that meant in terms of learning experiences varied significantly, right, across, across the sort of demographics of schools, in terms of the quality of the learning experiences and the opportunities to use that technology in more enabling and capital enhancing uh, kinds of ways. Um, I'll, I'll move again through these really quickly, but the sort of we've got technology, so what? Um, you know, what we found is what other researchers have found that this school was relatively technology rich but curriculum poor. Some of you might be familiar with, um, with, 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 with Margolis' work uh, as well as others who have sort of explored a very similar dynamic um, in terms of um, uh, the, just the, the lack of, 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 of quality instruction that's happening uh, in certain kinds of classrooms. Who gets to learn STEM? Uh, thinking here um, about Oakes' work and thinking about learning climate, sort of thinking about uh, the opportunity uh, to learn. And what we've sort of, and what we've come to understand, and there's data that supports this, right, is that black and Latino youth coming from kind of lower income families, resource constrained families, actually have aspirations, right, to pursue STEM based careers or STEM based pathways. Unfortunately, right, oftentimes their learning opportunities aren't necessarily commensurate, you know, with those aspirations. And so there are a lot of reasons for this, right, in terms of the learning climate, in terms of the, the, the equality of the learning climate, the opportunity to learn, the time of learning, the instructional expertise, there are all kinds of challenges, right, that really sort of frustrate and constrain their capacity to really sort of take advantage of these opportunities in sort of meaningful kinds of ways. And I already sort of referred to this, you know, this idea of hacking school, but we were sort of, uh, sort of struck by uh, the ways in which these students do school, right, uh, and the ways in which uh, they do school we found to be quite interesting and quite provocative in terms of how they were kind of redesigning school, right, to be um, in, in many ways, I think, uh, more relevant, um, both the in-school and out-of-school spaces, and I can certainly give you some examples of that uh, perhaps in the Q&A uh, later on. Um, so as we began to do this work, we began to, um, you know, start looking at a lot of the research and talking with designers, talking with um, a variety of, of stakeholders, and really kind of thinking about, you know, you know, as technology comes into the classroom, and as we think about the future of learning, you know, what kinds of learning opportunities, what kinds of learning skills, what kinds of literacies, what kinds of dispositions should we really be trying to help students develop? And this, I think, is a really challenging and really interesting problem. Um, and, and there are a lot of interesting um, sort of ideas about this, but here are just three that I want to highlight. So this idea, right, of teaching students, right, the, 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 the power of design and innovation, right? And so we hear a lot about design thinking coming into the classroom and what that means uh, and how important that is. This idea um, that, um, and I'm borrowing this from, from Tyler Cowan, an economist from George, um, I think George, George Washington University, George, um, I think it's George Washington, um, George Mason, I'm sorry, in Washington, D.C. But he has a book called um, the, the Age of Average is Over. And it's a really provocative uh, sort of statement. I mean, since what he argues, right, is that we, we are steadily progressing towards an economy and towards a society where eventually there will be two classes of workers, right? Those whose skills are a complement to, to smart technologies or intelligent machines, and those whose skills are being replaced by intelligent machines. 
And so what does that mean in terms of, and he's being somewhat facetious, and we know that, that, that the scenarios are much more complex than that, but it suggests, right, that the kinds of skills and dispositions that we should be helping young people develop really need to pay attention to the kinds of future opportunities and the sort of formation of this knowledge economy uh, that we see happening. Um, so I'm going to skip through this really quickly um, just because there's just not a lot of time. But after spending uh, this year and a half or so in the school, we went back to the school and asked them if we could design, right, um, kind of a media space or a design studio, if you will, that tried to incorporate certain kinds of principles that we felt um, that responded to the kind of environment, that responded to the setting that we were in. Um, and I can talk more about this later if, th if there's an opportunity. Um, but let me just show you um, what we had students doing. Um, well, I won't show it to you because it's, it's a couple of minutes. Is, should I not show it? Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, so, so basically what we did was we, so we tried to create a space where students were really sort of putting the design principles of design thinking sort of into practice, right? That is learning is networked, learning is connected to the community, uh, learning uh, as distributed, uh, learning as shared purpose, and learning as production oriented, right? Um, that is to say, students making something, something tangible, something that could be expressed, how ideas could be communicated in a very tangible kind of way. And we had them really sort of, we were using iPads, we were using other kind of technologies, but we gave them a design challenge around issues of food justice, food equity, uh, social inequality, and essentially uh, built a really interesting sort of interactive story uh, using um, some of Apple's software, um, and they created this really sort of fabulous sort of interactive book that hopefully, um, now that I put it out there, you'll demand it to get a chance to see. So I'll stop there. know where to put it, so I can just put it on here. It's not going to scream at anybody. No? Okay. Well, thank you, um, Dean Schwartz. It's the first time I've gotten to say that. He said I had a curtsy when I said that, but I told him I was from Berkeley, and we don't do that at Berkeley. <laughs> But Dan and Bridget and colleagues, I'm really excited to be here as part of this, this effort. I think it's really important and exciting, and I'm glad I have an opportunity to kind of contribute to the conversation. And I'm really going to just kind of think aloud with you. Um, I wanted to discuss three things very briefly with you tonight. And the first part, um, I actually wrote down some notes because it's, a kind of, it's usually the part that we ignore and we don't talk about, and I wanted to make sure that we attended to it. But I wanted to say something as a preface, that while I'm a researcher and a designer um, of in learning environments, I actually have, my projects have been in schools and informal and informal settings. So for over 20 years, I've had after school programs that were technology and rich and STEM rich, um, working in schools with non, what I call students from non-dominant communities working with teachers and youth. And for over 15 years, I had a program for secondary students who were from migrant farm worker backgrounds. And so the stuff that I'm gonna talk about is about design, but it's also always about curriculum. So I think that even though I'm talking about it, it's also the way I think about designing learning environments as a teacher and as a researcher. So I'm hoping that that will echo. So the three th things I want to talk about, and I know you have your timers here because we tend to go over, is I want to just briefly talk about a framework that I use in my own work that is oriented towards consequential forms of learning and equity-oriented practice and outcomes. And the reason I wanted to take a few minutes is because equity is often part of the rationale that we use to get our grants, to design new classes, but um, it's never explicitly a design principle that is carried out or iterated throughout the design process and through implementation. So I wanted to pay attention to some of these things that I think need to be foregrounded in the work we do as teachers and as designers. 
I want to share some insights from our, our Connected Learning Research Network. You'll see a lot of resonance with Craig. We've gotten to think together a lot over the years. And then Bridget asked me to talk very briefly about a new initiative that I'm part of with Apple Connect Ed and to show you the kinds of thinking that's going on in working with another foundation to do this kind of work. So see if I can do that in 20 minutes. So very, very briefly, I wanted to just start that, that the theory of change in my work with youth from non-dominant communities holds that learning, and this phrase should sound familiar, should be life-wide and life-deep and oriented towards transforming the world as it is into the world that it could be. Now, I, I choose those phrases because we actually were the authors of that piece for the Life Center, the Life Wide and Life Deep, and that concept has really held, I think it's really resonated. So toward this end, consequential and equitable learning should be normative practice for all youth in the U.S., indeed across the globe, where youth participate in tool-saturated environments, with a range of forms of assistance and participation regularly available. Within this view, tools are not considered neutral or the target of learning activity. Instead, tools should facilitate more consequential transformative ends personally, educationally, and socially. So this view of learning that I'm talking about is embedded within meaningful practices and supportive relationships. In our work, in our after-school clubs with novice teachers and youth, we call that relational equity because we're looking for participation structures that are, that are um, organized, uh, um, more symmetrical kinds of relation around learning. It recognizes diverse pathways and forms of knowledge and expertise. Within this view, the focus is on mechanisms that engender and sustain connected learning across the fears of interest peer culture, family, and academic life. Here, technology should help us build shared purpose, opportunities for production, and openly networked resources and meaningful pathways. And this is particularly important for youth from non-dominant communities, and I have a special interest in English language learners who often are at the shallow end. And one of the things we've learned from our collective work is that Youth from um, more resourced, resourced homes also ha are, are heavily networked. They're networked not only in terms of tools, but in terms of social relations. And one of the things that we find when we're pushing technology is that we don't figure out ways for our kids to have also, for these youth from non-dominant communities to develop these expansive networked kinds of relations and ways to use the information that they're, uh, that they're gaining. So overall, for me, my work is guided by kind of robust notions of learning and culture and approaches to design that seek to be ecologically valid, sustainable, and consequential to stakeholders. So I want to say a little, little bit about why I focus on ecology. Um, one of the things that's been really important to me in my work is that there's such a tendency to want to fix the individual or to fix that community, right? Instead of thinking about how can I, what I call re-hyphen mediate, how can I remediate the environment so that all kids can be smart, right? And so the focus on ecology is really important for me, whether I'm designing curriculum, whether I'm designing new learning environments, because it, it forces me to attend to a couple of things that I'm just going to very quickly highlight. The history of that community, its participants, its resources, its level of diversity, the constraints and resources for sustaining that community, as well as the threats to that ecology. So there should be attention to the resource, resources and social networks available to members of the community. It also should be concerned with what youth and others learn in their movement across everyday practices. So something that's really important for me is my frustration that we define who youth are and what they know by observing them in one setting, instead of really trying to understand what we call their rep the repertoires of practice. That is, what takes hold as youth move in and across the everyday practices of their lives. Those repertoires um, are more useful to me in terms of design as in teaching. So I'm not very concerned whether Shelley knows math, right, or what she doesn't know in math. 
I'm much more interested, it's much more productive for me to know what is Shelley's history of involvement in mathematical practices, right? So that notion of learning as movement and figuring out people's repertoires is key to the kind of work that I'm doing. So you can tell from this that equity is really a key to this approach and a central design principle in my design base and other research. So for me, um, equity is both ideal and pragmatic. And I say it's ideal and pragmatic because it is an aspiration. I do, I do believe in a more just world. I do believe that resources of all kinds should be more equally distributed where all people can benefit. So it is ideal in that way, but it's also pragmatic. It's pragmatic in that I've turned it into a design principle that I think is really, really um, important in the kind of work that I do. And I talk about measures in other papers that I can say more in the Q&A. But uh, foregrounding equity, I think, is really important because it brings attention um, ongoing attention to and monitor the degree of well-being in a community. So I use the notion of the miner's canary. Now, my father was a copper miner. This is a coal miner, but I know a lot about mining. And so you may know that the miners would have a canary on their hat so that they could detect the presence of poisonous gases, right? And then the poor canary died. You knew it was time to, the, the health of that ecology was failing. So I think that equity is a really robust principle because it not only tells us about how youth from non-dominant communities are faring, it tells us about the health and well-being of the entire ecology, right? So I really like this notion of thinking about it as our miner's canary and making it a first order principle in the way we think about designing curricula and learning environments. So I want to turn you to um, some work that's come out of the many years we've been doing this Connected Learning Research Project. I have a huge team in Berkeley, go Berkeley. Um, and um, Bridget's going to be our discussant soon, so this is a little preview. So I want to just share a little bit about the many dimensions to this work, um, but tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. Of course, it's grounded in the notion of connected learning that Bridget and Craig have already talked about. So this was a dream opportunity. I always got to study kids in schools or after school, but I always wanted to study them across settings, to follow them and to really understand more about their families. And so this is a, a multi-sided ethnography in which we observed about 60 to 75 youth from our STEM-oriented after-school club called El Pueblo Magico and a subset of these youth and their families across a range of settings and activities to document the family's everyday practices and their uses of new media. For three years, we spent a minimum of eight hours, this is reality TV, silly, this is um, bar none, minimum eight hours in the homes of 14 families in, from low-income communities, ma the majority of whom were heter heterogeneous group of Latino families. And we collected extensive data that included home videos taken by both us and the families and the kids. So there were family-generated videos, surveys, artifacts, interviews, and field notes written by the undergraduate novice teachers working with the children at El Pueblo, and artifacts produced by the children and their amigas or amigos in joint activity. And this was really modeled after a long-term study I did at UCLA on the middle-class lives of, 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 of the middle-class lives of working families. Um, and so that one of the things we learned from that study about middle class families is how much time middle class families invest in organizing the activities for their children's future. Right? And we usually just think about that with middle class families, but we find low income families also do it. They just have a different set of available resources to do, but they are, pay a lot of attention to the way they're organizing. Um, the future for their own children in their own environments. So for us, understanding family life involved documenting their daily routines, their beliefs and practices around health, new media, social networks, and energy use. So um, building on this project, one of the things that we learned is that um, before making conjectures about youth learning and potential and the efficacy of tools and arrangements 
and it really requires careful observation and documentation of youth behavior across settings, not just in schools. And I think these approaches are really critical if we're going to move away from static portraits of individuals and communities to a more dynamic views that seek to capture the complexity in full range of people's activity, including one thing that I feel is so important, there's always regularity and variance in communities, and we need to capture that, right? This dyna dynamic view of human activity, I think, has huge implications for the ways we think about equity and consequential learning, and I think it's very central to the kind of work that, Bridget, that your um, group is trying to do as well. So one really interesting strand of work that we've been looking at is um, the notion of ingenuity, which is really informed, uh, our theoretical construct is really informed by your colleague here and my friend Ray McDermott, um, who has done wonderful work on ingenuity. But this really grew out of some of our many meetings across the country nationally in which there were a lot of people interested in making and tinkering and they were saying, how do we get these poor kids to engage in making and tinkering? And my response is, have you ever been to any neighborhood on any weekend, on any household? And what you learn is that making and tinkering are indigenous practices. They're, it, making and tinkering are part of human activity, right? And so we've really been studying um, this notion of everyday ingenuity and really take a view. And I think there's so much to learn educationally when you start to reframe what people do and try to understand the really interesting, innovative ways in pe way people are using technology. And one of the things we wanted to push back on, it wasn't like necessity is the mother of invention. These poor people are really poor, so they have to innovate. No, it's much more, it's much richer and much more complex than that. And so we're finding in our work, and I want to show you some examples, that right now, these are some of the categories that we're coming up with. And they are around resourcefulness, <coughs> making and tinkering, which we think are different, fixing, and this really cool one about boundary crossing, which has to do with identity work, and the notion of line stepping. I just have to take a second, because that comes from one of my wonderful graduate students, Patrick Johnson, who took it from a Dave Chappelle show. And I just thought, oh my God, I want, to sh I want to quote Dave Chappelle in some paper. I just think that would be so cool. But he has this, uh, um, this skit in which this, I forget which person it was, comes and he's complete, Rich, oh, Rick James comes and he's completely inappropriate, crosses all kinds of boundaries. Uh, but, but we're going to reframe that notion of line stepping to talk about the ways people develop new identities. And we've seen this a lot with our, our young women who are engaged in in new media practices that are supposed to be and are supported and oriented more for men, for boys, right? There's a lot of line stepping, a lot of boundary crossing that happens in this work. So um, I wanted to take a second to show you, if I can, a little bit about um, how in studying these families and looking at the kinds of ingenuity, how mom keeps surfacing as an expert we know that the smartphone has really democratized the home in lots of ways, that moms have used the, the smartphone in really, really interesting, interesting ways. And so they hear moms use, I'm going to go through these because I have only a minute, uh, and I want to know there's one minute so I can talk about Apple. Um, so mom is the, the expert here. This mom, um, which I won't have time to show you, uh, really kind of pushes back on the notion that families, low-income families don't care about their children, which we know is nuts. But anyway, here's this mother who, because, as you might know, low-income neighborhoods get a lot of people, um, sex offenders and people who've reduced in prison dumped into their neighborhoods. It's not because there's more per capita in those neighborhoods. They're dumped in there. So this neighborhood has a high proportion of sex offenders. And so this mom go every morning looks at the website through her phone, and she routes a pathway for her kids carefully so they're avoiding all the places where they should go. And of course, they're making fun of her like, oh, brother, I can't go this way now. Mom says not to go here. I can't wait. So that, so here's just a really innovative way in which mom is using kind of the, um, the smartphone to talk about, to, to really kind of engineer family life. Is there one more? 
we see that um, we, we're looking at how ingenuity in working class families happens in everyday practices. I have a video of just a family just in a truck doing their homework and doing these things. If we have time in Q&A, I'd love to show it. it because there's so much to learn about uh, what you learn from everyday practices. So much to learn about it. Uh, another one about the cultural modeling that, that happens um, in families and how we look at the shifting schemas of parenting. A lot of models of parenting that come in. So there's so much. So I think looking and focusing just on the new media is missing so much, right? It doesn't tell you about how families organize for particular kinds of learning, for pathways, for opportunities um, for youth. So again, we have a study that's looking at the boundary crossing and the ingenuity, the line stepping. But I want to skip over here. Oh, that's my great video. Because there's some really interesting things that we've learned in overall in looking at some of these family practices. And one of them has implications for schools. Because in our homes, um, because of the shortage of devices, there's a lot of joint activity around the use of new media. And yet school, and it's not because of a learning style. Got to make sure you don't think that. Um, but we go back to schools, and schools still privilege a one-to-one -one correspondence with technology. You have your own computer, your own little project, and here you do it. And yet we know how much is learned in joint activity. So there's some really important implications there. Um, that we, we also think we get a much better understanding of how families use mobile tools. And we can speak to the evolving norms of media in schools from studying everyday practices. And we can foreground innovation and resourcefulness to really circumvent deficit discourses, right? And that's why we chose to focus on ingenuity. It's rich. It's there. We aren't inventing it. This is how people live, right? So Apple, <laughs> I'm part of the Apple Connected um, new initiative on their research advisory group. And um, they've given me, I think, I don't have it yet, but some money. And what I'm going to get to do is what the Apple uh, Connected initiative selected 100 of, its, of the nation's poorest schools and brought, brought iPads to those schools. But they didn't want to make the mistake that LA did and just dump these iPads. And so they have a whole network of team from curriculum developers to people on the ground understanding the community to finding out who's Miss Myrtle in that community, you know, the, the informant, the person who knows everything. And really having us as researchers help them think about how to do this in a more equitable and ecological way. So I'm going to, in my work, focus on English learners in a couple of case study schools and replicate kind of this ecological approach to understanding new media um, opportunities and constraints, both in schools and out of schools for this population of really low income, really under-resourced um, schools and communities for youth that I know have lots of potential and who can, can, that can be smart. So I look forward to telling you about that study sometime. So thank you. I didn't use the, didn't use the video, but I'm going to leave it up here in case they want to see it. My humor. <laughs> About an hour and a half. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I was recently uh, on Fox News, and if you learn anyone debating on Fox News, you just talk really fast and don't look at anyone and just keep going. <laughs> so I'm going to try that and just just block out everything else here. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably control the mic as well. Well, I'm Mohammed Chadu, Silicon Valley Education Foundation, and I want to give some local context really quickly to all the great work that you've heard and what we're doing in the neighborhood. And it be, uh, behooves me to introduce when we started down some of our work. Um, we're really focused, we're really obsessed with preparing students for college and career readiness. So the context may be broader, but how it fits in, I'll show you in just a few minutes. When you think about Silicon Valley, a lot of people, especially outside of Silicon Valley, think that there's money falling out of people's pockets. What, what possible need could you have in Silicon Valley? And the way I describe Silicon Valley is there's a, there's a Silicon Valley up 280 where you have all the riches in the world, 
And then you have the Silicon Valley Up 101, where 30 computers watching video will crash the, crash the wireless infrastructure. Uh, over and over and over we saw this. So, so a lot of our work at the Silicon Valley Education Foundation, SVF, is up that 101 corridor, and you'll find a lot of the needs that represent across the country as well, that, as you heard about in Texas and other places um, as well. Our work is really in three areas. Um, advocacy, how do we put policies in districts? Silicon Valley has about 55 school districts, about 350,000 students, um, but we have 55 school districts, and each one of them are autonomous and unique, and how do we have them work together on some of these things? Um, we work in the area of making um, the A to G, the scripting courses of D, uh, for the CSU and UC system, the default curriculum, and a few other things. We have some great programs, which I'll tell you about another time. Um, and in innovation, and today I just want to tell you a little bit about the work we're doing in innovation. I know we're in short on time, so I'm going to move really fast here. But in the innovation space, what we're working on in these districts is in three ways. One is how do we get them money to invest in technology? And this, this is where, um, this is a fancy graphic of where Roy P., myself, and Jim Shelton were sitting at a table at Stanford, and Roy drew a picture which I've got, I've got a version of that, Roy, I'll show you uh, how it's evolved as we've developed this model, but Roy, um, um, and with all kidding aside, really helped us develop this model to implement in Silicon Valley, and I think we're seeing a lot of those results, Roy. Thank you for all that you did. Um, the infrastructure piece, and then the adoption of technology, how does that happen in, uh, in Silicon Valley in particular? Uh, Craig, some of the data that you shared around Hispanic and African American students, we've got a up that 101 corridor, it's over 50% Hispanic as well, uh, if you look at the, uh, the data. So in the money, in California, there's two ways to pass uh, a, a tax. One is an operational dollar parcel tax, which requires a two-thirds vote. One is a 55% uh, threshold for a bond. What we were able to do in Eastside Union High School District was to have a bond measure qualify for technology. So this is how we passed a $113 million bond, to, uh, which they will not spend all up front, but over time. So the interest payments are next to nothing, and now they have, they have money over the next over 10 years to spend this money, which allows them to understand how they can truly invest in technology in school districts. And what we'd like to see this happening at least across California so we can increase the investments in technology and school districts aren't scrambling some of the data that you guys showed uh, in terms of one-to-one -one devices, in terms of the infrastructure. How do you really do that, starting with the money and how do we get the community to invest in that? Eastside Union High School District is the model for that up, up, up in, down in San Jose um, that we can look at and I can share more about later. The next piece of our work has really been around the infrastructure. Again, this wireless infrastructure, the back end stack at these school districts is terrible. They, some of these are still using servers and, and old technology which are patched together and not really connecting. So what, where we've been working on with a bunch of Valley leaders as well as uh, PwC and a few others, we've put together uh, a paper on what does that back end stack look like in these school districts? And how do they leverage technology in a meaningful way where it's integrated? I mean, single sign-on, all the issues um, um, that come into this. Uh, we developed a white paper on this. Uh, we, we can share it at, um, at our website as well. But it really goes into how, what does the infrastructure at these school districts looks like in order to spend that money properly. You know, everyone uses the LA example of how not to do it. But I think that's overplayed. It's really about here's a model. Here's a stack. Is it open source? How do we provide this to more and more districts? And we have a bunch of districts using this um, technology as well. And then when we did the ass assessment through uh, of districts, local districts, um, based on this white paper, what you saw, what we saw, was actually where the full implementation of all these items is very narrow. And th these are real districts that, that we show. So darker is better here. Um, we're going with a green theme of the room with this slide as well. Um, um, so so, you, so we're, we're seeing how districts can actually improve their infrastructure as they go along versus dinging them and putting them on a curve to do that and providing the support to do that. 
The third piece of our work, and I'm um, trying to be, be very brief here, is really how do you get them to adopt technology? And you know, you've got all these great ed tech companies, some of them may be in the room, and these great school districts. How do you provide that bridge? And this is where we've got lots of partners coming together um, around school districts, product, partnerships, research and evaluation, and folks like um, uh, unlikely partners, like a company called Trinet, who's in the, actually in the room as well, Jim, Jim and others, uh, who are doing interesting work helping the ed tech companies and the school districts with HR and other issues so they can be seamless, so they can, they can connect the dots between the innovators and the school districts so we have faster adoption uh, across districts, not single teachers who are um, islands of excellence uh, in these districts. So lots of great partners, and this, this was, uh, Roy, this may look familiar. This, uh, we just added some color to, to your great slide here. So with that, I mean, are some of our top challenges um, are how do we work with districts? How do we get um, common contracts? How do we really bring together professional development, which was talked about earlier, as well as the collaboration within school districts, forget outside of school districts, in order to, to implement this work? And um, that's where we invite you to join us, our iHub, our Learning Innovation Hub, uh, where we're bringing this together in Silicon Valley as a local model, which hopefully will reflect beyond the valley um, at, as well as we go, go forward. And, Bridget has generally joined the advisory board on some of this work as well, so thank you, Bridget, for doing that. But the real people who are implementing this are back here, Tim Bussey and Arti. Uh, please talk to, talk to them uh, as we go forward. And with that, thank you uh, for allowing us to join this uh, journey. And I think we, we would love for folks in here to use Silicon Valley as your backyard to implement the great ideas, test the great ideas, let's break it, let's build it as we go. Uh, with that, I hopefully I've been able to give you some time back as well. Thank you. Question. All right, we'll start down here. Angela's going to bring you a mic. Um, hi, my name is Mary Jean. Um, I'm interested in learning how you build the learning of uh, social capital um, into the equity piece. I'll just compare it to being on this campus. I grew up nearby, kids playing soccer, building their social equity in college. And then the opposite side, the real estate course I'm taking at City College, nobody's building any social equity there. So how do you do that and how do you get the social equity to cross class divides in, in, in work? So other than the kid that gets a scholarship, how do you build that in? I know a couple of you brought that up. I'll, uh, I'll go first. Um, I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's an, an important question. Um, so there are a lot of takeaways from the study that we did in the, in the, in the Austin area, and one of them sort of pertains pr precisely to, to this issue here of, um, and I'm not quite sure how you're using social capital, right, but, but, but in terms of how I think about it, is this, um, you know, how do we cultivate, and it's basically social networks, right, social relationships, social resources, um, and, and the kinds of benefits that, um, that ensue as a result of those relationships. And, and one of the things that, that, that we found is that um, particularly lower income schools, right, you know, tend to be um, socially isolated. And so as a result, um, you know, they tend to be disconnected from the, from the networks where, where resources, where information, uh, you know, get exchanged and, and, and transmitted in very ordinary kinds of ways. The, the scenario that you just described, right, settings, environments, geography can oftentimes influence and impact that. So one of the ways that we're trying to conclude that the book that, that we're writing is, is sort of addressing this question, right? And that is, 
how can schools that find themselves right on the sort of periphery of where how power gets exchanged, right? And not just financial power, but really these, these social relationships. Um, as schools invest in technology, as schools invest in um, you know developing human capital, you know. It's, it's also important, right, that schools also think about creative ways to invest in, in sort of cultivating social capital as well. Um, and there's some different things that we try to talk about in terms of uh, you know, schools to try to become more networked, more open, more connected, you know, establishing relationships with, with, with the broader community, um, leveraging the expertise of teachers, leveraging the expertise of, of parents and some of the ingenuity uh, that, um, that, that Chris was alluding to. Um, and even sort of rethinking the, the school that we were in, they didn't call the, the, the counselor a school counselor they, or, or an academic counselor. Uh, they were what they call transition counselors, right? So this idea is that they were helping students transition beyond high school. But as we know, right, in, in, in most of those environments, um, you know, counselors, you know, they have more students than they could ever meet with. Um, they aren't fully resourced or really fully respected in terms of what they might be able to bring to the school. But we thought that might be an interesting resource, an interesting opportunity for schools to become more connected uh, and to begin to start investing in relationships that we think are a absolutely important and absolutely critical uh, to kids um, sort of developing, uh, you know, the kinds of opportunities that they might have access to. So, so m my response to you is that I, I think that's a really important, I think it's an important issue when it oftentimes gets overlooked. Um, and, and how do we begin to think about how schools can really strengthen and enhance uh, and really diversify uh, the social resources that, that they and their, and their students have access to. I'll just add one. Oh, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. I'll be here all quarter, so. Um, I was just going to say there's a really interesting example you're going to hear later in the, in the quarter from Nicole Pinkard. And she created a model in Chicago where she brought in artists as mentors and they in turn had their own social networks which they then shared with the, the young people and that was a, a very powerful design approach. I wonder if some things have got to do with um, um, the Ulster Fellow at the Exploratorium Planning Museum and one of my favorite things that I think this building um, kind of Calfrey was talking about is the explainer. And these are young high school, usually high school age who are kids who at youth who are given lots of knowledge around science and the, the exhibits and design, and they look, they develop a whole repertoire of tools from the content to how to talk about it, to how to, and um, many of them then take on, a, a, there's actually a pathway, they take on other roles later in the exploratorium, and they're seeing the trajectory of those years going into different kinds of um, pathways into schools and colleges and other opportunities. And so I love this visual. I guess my point is you have to design for mm -hmm. it. I think you just can't will it and wish it to be. It has to be a conscious, conscious effort um, in the spaces that they're in. Thank you. Next question. Angela, way in the back. Oh, did you have one teed up? Yes. Okay, you'll be next. Sure, yeah. Uh, for Professor Watkins or anyone, I guess, but you teed yourself up for this one. So you mentioned the idea of, of doing school, um, which I think is a, that brings something probably different to everyone's mind. So could you elaborate a little bit on what you meant when you said how students were doing school and then maybe what, what role technology has and how students do school? Yeah, I sort of, so some of you may be familiar with, with, with Pope's work around, around doing school. And in that book, for example, I think she followed maybe six or seven or eight or so um, students who were kind of in, in high performing schools, sort of high stakes schools. And she was really sort of, uh, through her interviews with them and the, the ethnographic work that she did, she was really trying to document um, how these students navigate um, the schooling environment, the high expectations. These were students who were, um, you know, in, in advanced courses, extracurricular activities. And so how do they navigate the pressure? How do they navigate that environment? And a lot of them really sort of, you know, gave examples of just how they do school, how, how they do that. And it struck me, right, as an interesting sort of framework, and I was just curious to, to sort of to take a similar kind of framework and apply it to the students that we saw, right, who were in a very different kind of environment, very different sort of expectations, um, and very different kinds of opportunities. Um, and yet, you know, how they approached school and how they did school, I thought was just as, 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 as creative, just as resilient, 
um, you know, just as um, strategic in some ways. And so in that sense, you know, really trying to think about the ways in which these students mobilized what resources they had available to them to really make school matter uh, in ways that it otherwise simply uh, did not matter. And we were just struck by the things that they were doing both in the classroom, but more importantly, the way in which they were creating these dynamic and sort of robust learning ecologies after school, right? And how they were cultivating relationships with other peers, cultivating re relationships with key teachers who could give them access to technologies that they could, let's say a laptop, or if, if they were producing music or producing videos, um, and they didn't have this at home, via the relationships that they were strategically cultivating with teachers, they were able to then, you know, get access to, to, to technology that otherwise they may not have had access to. But they were, they were essentially designing, right? a kind of learning ecology, designing an environment um, that really kind of afforded them the opportunities that they weren't getting uh, during a formal or, or sort of regular school day. Um, and it's just something I would have, you know, again, you know, being in that environment, being sort of immersed in that context, you were able to see it and to see how they were doing this. But it sort of suggested to us, right, that, that, that most young people, irregardless of, of race or class or ethnicity or, or household income, do school in some really interesting ways. It's just a matter of, of acknowledging it identifying it, documenting it, and then trying to understand it. And really sort of alluding to some of the things that, that, that Chris was getting at in terms of just the ingenuity, the resilience, the creativity. And this is not innovation out of desperation, right? It's innovation out of just the, the will and the desire to be creative, to, to, to explore, to be expressive, uh, and finding alternative ways to do that when the school ordinarily uh, was not designed for them to be able to do that. He reminded me of his, there's a tradition, a Seleucid tradition, in his sister group called Doing Being School. And um, the notion of the resolution group was it's the truth or display. It makes it look like learning, mm -hmm. it sounds like learning, but it's not. The kids are engaged mm -hmm. in all the trappings of school, but not doing it. And what that's one of the things our con we've been concerned with through around technology is how much procedural display there is, because <coughs> kids are the the the, the, social, the activities are not organized to promote consequential kinds of learning, right? So. I think that that's a stark contrast to what Craig's talking about, which often happens for kids who are really engage in the procedural display. And with these students, there was they, you know, they went to the teacher and said, bec I mean, because they weren't satisfied with, with, with the technology courses that, that they had access to, they went to the teacher and said, can we create, you know, a club, an alternative space to really pursue the kinds of interests, the kinds of activities, the kinds of exercises, the kind of collaborative uh, pursuit um, that they were more driven by around creating games, you know, really modest kinds of games, but nevertheless, right, doing this, you know, outside of any kind of formal instructional context. But of course, you know, with, with the support of teachers, with the support of, of other mentors, but really sort of taking the lead in doing that. And, and, and to us, it was just a really interesting example of how these students were, were, were leveraging school in some really important ways. And, and for us, one of the other takeaways was it's, it's, we're really critical of schools and we tend to be critical of schools, but, but, but we, sort of left that study thinking that schools may in fact for a lot of students may be one of the last best opportunities that they have to really cultivate the kinds of assets, the kinds of skills and dispositions that this knowledge economy requires. But it's just a matter of sort of flipping school or redesigning school so that it matters in ways that kids can connect to. Hi there, thank you so much. Um, I think we're at a really interesting intersection of challenge in, in the integration of tech. And I'm wondering if you could comment about um, about developmental differences from very early grades. I'm very excited about um, high school integration of creative uses of tech. As I look at research on kind of screen time and early early integration, there's a lot of health concerns. Um, the director of family and community health at UC Berkeley has um, raised a lot of concern about you know the wireless radiation. Ch very young children absorb twice as much into their brain, ten times more into their skull. About a week and a half ago, the American Brain Tumor Association put out a, a report that um, malignant brain tumors are the leading cause of cancer-related death among young adults and adolescents. And I know that the Santa Clara County Medical Association and a number of, um, I guess, health organizations are raising awareness about this. The one-to-one -one initiative, um, there's a lot of concern about this nationally, and you yeah. mentioned, Dr. Gutierrez, that this is targeting low-income um, communities, will there be any sort of like a fourth bubble of development and health um, concerns and safe use of technology, you know, guidelines for families to, to keep the tech away from their bodies, not to sleep under the pillow, et cetera? 
Um, I know that's a lot, but I wonder if you might comment on some of the health and developmental sure. concerns. Thank you. Anybody feel ready to respond to that? <laughs> no, but it, uh, the, uh, it's interesting that a lot of our families are are hiding some of this health <laughs> stuff, whether it's health knowledge or where the information is coming from. <laughs> no, I'm saying the families, the, the Dharma, the Dharma knowledge. Um, I think that there is concern, but there's lots of different kinds of concern. One is health, and one is uh, is how overregulated kids are already. And where's the space for just creativity and innovation? And so the, the balance for how technology can, you know, every tool is enabled.